Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me here in my shop. I'm about to start a new project, something that's even got me pretty scared in a way. Look at this. Oh my gosh. Look at this. This is from 1929. And look at the condition of this. It's, it's a stunner. Oh my gosh. Okay, so the owner of this radio lives here in the same uh, city as me. He purchased this radio and, uh, just before giving it to me to, to take a look at. Uh, didn't pay a lot of money for this. And he was told by the owner, uh, the uh, an older woman uh, who has basically had possession of this since, since it was brand new, 1929. Um, she said it worked. He said she plugged it in, turned it on, it, it made some noise, but um, other than that, we don't really know what kind of state it's in electronically. But she did plug it in and turn it on, so that, that's a huge step forward for me here. So we're going to start by taking a close look at the uh, front of it here. It's in unbelievably good shape. It's just unbelievable. Yes, there's a few nicks. Nobody gets through life without a few nicks, including this guy. But look at that, that's amazing. And look at that, it's just beautiful looking. It really is. I'm stunned. <laughs> I'll lower my camera here. Get a more of a face on, look at this. So typical of a 1920s radio, um, late 1920s radio, you reduce the tuning to one knob. It's a wooden knob with a crack just going past halfway here. And it's got the brass insert, so you wouldn't expect it to crack like that. Oh, they're all, they're all pretty loose. There's the screw. This one, this one has no, appears to have no brass insert, so this is the likely one to crack. It's like tightening the screw down. Well, this one comes off also. It's got a brass insert, but it's also cracked. Does it all match? Yeah, yeah, pretty sure those are the originals. Okay, no problem with the notch coming off. Yeah, often when I look in this age of radio, when you look in to see the dial, it's uh, it's in really rough shape. But not, not, not this one. This one's actually in really good shape. Let's see if we can tune this radio. Okay. Here we are. Look at that. I don't want to do too much here before we look inside. Fantastic. So, a lot of cabinets in this vintage are made with a, a, uh, a resin that uh, looks like looks like wood or is made from wood powder. But I think there's a lot of detail in here. Especially stuff like this. I think this is all wood. I think it's all wood. Fantastic. Look at the detail up here. Wow. Oh, yeah, up here. <laughs> it's hard to see. The detail on the edge here. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to turn this guy around. We're going to have a look at what's in the back of it. This is pretty much the heaviest radio I've ever handled, and I've handled some very heavy radios. So to turn something like this around, I, I really don't want to lift it right up. It's a little too heavy. So I'm going to pivot it, pivot it on one foot. So I'm just going to lift it up from the corner and just rotate it like this. As usual, the, these old radio cabinets are solid, absolutely solid after all these years. It's full of copper, that'd be my guess. That's what makes it so heavy. So there we are. So I know the biggest problem, and ob biggest obvious problem with this radio is the speaker. We're gonna take a look at it in a minute. But let's start with the uh, cabinet here. 
Um, it has a pretty good nameplate on it. And I took a photograph of that nameplate. I can read it very easily in the photograph here, which I'm going to do. So, a Temple Tone Radio. Licensed by Canada Radio Patents Limited only for the non-commercial reception of public radio telephone broadcasting. Patents uh, all the years from 1914 to 1926. So I think this is a 1929 radio, but uh, I don't know that for sure. There's no model number as such, so it's just called Temple Tone Radio. Now, it was made by the Temple Canadian Limited, made by Temple Canadian Limited in Toronto. 125 watts, 25 cycle. But we're going to run it on 60 cycle, which is actually easier for it. Great, so I've already managed to find one supposed schematic for this radio, but I'm not sure it's correct yet. If we look at the back of it here, antenna and ground written right on these terminals. This is phono, so this is for your uh, record player input here. We have one, two, three, four tubes all by themselves. And this one looks a little different than the others. What are they? Patented in Canada, 1928 to 1946. So these are relatively new too. 1946. Are they making tubes like this in 46? That doesn't quite hold out to me. But there it is. That's a tube inside there. Slot for the uh, cap wire. This tube is pulled over. Cap wire seems really tight. Well, practice doesn't, you know, it's not likely they built it with this pulled over tight like that. So I don't know what to make of that. We're not going to do too much with this inside the. Uh, inside the cabinet, I don't think. Some more cans here, probably holding coils, hard to say. And these big green cans, if you can even see them on the camera, it's so dark. These two huge cans here probably have the power supply filtering and things like that. Okay, now we're going to go just pop the camera off the tripod here. Okay. I hope my voice isn't too muffled. Now we're going to take a look at the speaker. This is this is the horror story area of this radio. You see the cone appears to be ripped right off the uh, voice coil. sound at all. That's kind of surprising. There's the uh, come on, radio. Come on, come on, camera. It just won't focus. Made by the same company though, Temple. And you can even see the uh, the color of this material. The look of it is the same as this up here. Lovely. Now, oh, hey, let's just pop this back up here. the power cord. Well, this is not original, that's for sure. So, I think, I think, now that I think about it, the, the current owner was told by the previous owner that the radio had been serviced maybe 10 years ago. Well, that's where this would have come from, for sure. Not polarized. Well, how to approach this? Um, I think, I think we should plug it in and turn it on. Um, I mean, that, that was done just a few weeks ago. 
why be so afraid of it now? I mean, cl clearly the speaker is not going to perform well. So why do that? So one of the reasons is the, the owner has heard this work a bit. If I remove everything and then put it on my bench and then it doesn't work on my bench, then I'm the guy who broke it. So uh, I don't want that to happen. And if it works at all here, I'd like to know about it. I'd like to know how it works, what it sounds like, stuff like that, before I start trying to lift it out and put it on my bench and monkey around with it. Every step of the way is a risk. Including turning it on. Can't be that much of a risk. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I can get plugged into my gizmo over here. Yes, looks like I can. Okay. Just getting things a little bit ready now. For an antenna, it looks like it's just this chunk of wire here. And this is this is a real mistake. On a radio like this, you really do need a loop antenna. But we will we will start with this piece of wire. And I'm just gonna kind of pinch it in my ceiling here so it's hanging vertically like that. So when I plug it in, uh, one of the first concerns or any concerns is that there's a short circuit or partial partial short circuit maybe in the power transformer or something like that inside the radio. And A, the radio is going to get damaged pretty quickly. And uh, you don't want that to happen. So I have some ways of detecting that kind of problem inside the set uh, when I first turn it on. And it's pretty simple. Just have a light bulb in series with the power wire. Now, I've, I've kind of set this up in my shop, so it's not obvious what's going on when I show it to you. But the power that reaches this radio will be passing through one or both of these light bulbs. The idea is, if there's a short circuit or something seriously wrong in the radio, the light bulb is going to light up and it's going to restrict the power. It's going to restrict the power enough that uh, you won't uh, you'll have time to react to serious problems before serious damage is done. I guess that's kind of a bottom line there. I'm also able to vary the input voltage with this control. And we're going to start out a little low. So that, that's about 50 volts there. 60, 70 volts. 70 volts. I'm going to direct the power through the light bulb. I don't want to turn it on just yet. Now, controls on the front of the radio. So I only have so many cameras and so many ways to view things. Um, is it better to view the back of the radio or the front? <laughs> well, the smoke and flames come out the back, but all the control knobs are on the front. Let's see it over this way. side of it. There, that's the compromise. The compromise is to watch the side. I'm going to watch it down here. Um, these knobs are not labeled. There's no labeling here. So we know this is the tuning. That sounds like, like an on-off switch. Very, very hard to turn. Of course, I don't have a knob on it, so. Oh, hard to turn in one direction only. Mm. So, one of these will be tone, I'm going to guess, and the other one is volume. And so the set is switched on. First, we want it off. And verify that, in fact, it is off when it's off. That's the first thing. The switch can be broken, it can be stuck on. So the way we do that is pretty easy. I'm gonna, whoops, whoops, I'm gonna plug it in here. Boy, you're getting a good look at my shop here today. Okay. So again, the only power that reaches this goes through these light bulbs over here. So the first action is the light bulb. What happens with the light bulb? 
and the power is only halfway. You flip the switch down, power through the light bulbs over the radio, radio switched off, nothing should happen. Very, very good. Nothing did happen. We're sending over 70 volts. Okay, and on the guy here, 72.9 volts. So that means there's no voltage drop. That means there's no current flowing into the radio. The voltage drop would be on that light bulb there if it were happening. So all this just proves the set can be turned off. <laughs> That's worth knowing, believe me. So now we're going to turn the set on. How far can I move this camera here? Just to get back, you know, from th things are going to explode here shortly. So. <laughs> no, nothing's going to explode. Well, I can't get it all in, in there, but for now, see those light bulbs way over there? Okay, so right now the power is on. I'm going to switch it off. No power to the radio, switch on. Okay, so we're watching this, 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 just this light bulb. It's probably going to come on very bright. This thing takes a fair bit of power, like 125 watts. On turn on, it's probably a lot more. So the light's going to be bright and then dull down. It's going to be hard to tell, but that's okay. Here we go. So contrary to what I said, both lights are screwed in. I thought only one was. They lit up a little bit and then went down. It just went down. This is very good. This is all indicating the radio operating normally. Nothing serious is going on. No serious badness. Okay, now I'm going to raise the uh, supply voltage up to where it should be. Okay, the lights are glowing here. Okay, the actual voltage supplied to the radio now is only 76 volts. I can hear the hum out of the speaker. 76 is too low, so we're going to uh, 76 is too low to operate, but I can't get it any higher here with these bulbs in. So I'm going to remove the bulbs. I'm going to turn this down to 70. So. Okay, so now we are hitting the radio with 87 volts. So that's probably enough to make it work. Go a little higher. The current draw is 75 watts. <coughs> 75 watts of power. That's fine. Okay, all indications are we can relax here. Nothing horrendous is going on. Let's see if we can get some sound out of it. Well, I would say no. Not a single sound. We're at 93 volts on it. I'm going to go a little higher. and 710 volts. The power now is um, 80-85 watts. So quite, quite a bit below the, uh, the stated on the back on the panel says 125 watts. So I don't think we're Hundred and ten volts. So. Hmm. Well, I'm not hearing a thing. Okay, let's get 
computer test. Well, absolutely nothing come from the speaker. Okay. Now I need to get around behind it and take a look. That's the best way. There's something humming. It could be a transformer humming in here. some of the lighting in here when well, it's got a lot of lights on. A lot of lights are on here. Yeah, so what just happened there? I just knocked the uh, wire out for that camera you're looking through. <laughs> just, why it's become a still image. So I just have to put the cord back in here. Oh. Crazy day. There we go. Back in the business now. We're looking at the radio in the dark. And the idea is what tubes are lit? Wow. What tubes are lit? We need a little more darkness. Well, can't get any darker than this. This is dark, dark, dark. So the four glass tubes that we're showing, they're all lit. Now, in these four cans, um, how can we tell if those are lit? Okay, so I can see, you can't, can you see my hand even? You can't see a thing. <laughs> okay, we'll put a little more light in here. Apparently my eyes are a little better than the camera. So I can see the filament in here. Look at these holes in the top. Oh, what was that? We have sound. Okay, it's not quite the kind of sound you want, but we have some sound. Okay, so I think really there's nothing more I can do at this point. I think the name of the game is it's got to go up on my bench and we got to get a good look at everything. Okay, uh, I think what we want to do is get the chassis out. Two fat bins. Okay, let's take off this wire. I don't think there's anything holding this in. Let's see. So I can see there's a metal plate on the bottom that did not move just now, and the upper main chassis moved. Hey! <laughs> hey, I made money. 25 cents. Wow. 1978, so it's nothing particularly old about that, but there we go. I've been paid already for doing this. I'll just take it off the bill. What I'll do. What other little goodies are up in here? Appears to be screw holes for screws to go in, but no screws. Well, how would you ever get a screw up in there? Can't get your hand in. So this side does appear to be loose. So I'm gonna look at the other side here. Why isn't it showing up as loose? So it feels like there's 
Looks, feel, feels like they must go right through a hole here, maybe. I don't know. The hole doesn't feel like it's in the right spot. Two more holes up here, nothing in them. There's nothing, there's nothing holding this radio in anymore. It could just be, it just, just weighs a ton. Literally. Caution. You must say disconnect power supply cord before removing on this sticker here. Uh, okay, so let me grab this big heady thing and see if I can lift it out this way. Seems to come up off of something. Okay, it's ready to come out. I'm going to lift this out. It's got to make it all the way to my bench in one fell swoop. Pull it out part way and have a cord caught on something because this weighs a lot. There's almost no clearance here. Wow. This is, this is not easy to do. My hand's inside and my hands won't come out. So I guess i got to slide it back further. I mean, it's heavy, but it's not as heavy as I thought. But it's heavy. Hey, okay, there we go. Whoo, what is that? You know what? That's what's left of the million dollar bill that was in there along with the quarter. So these are leaves. Sure look like leaves. They certainly are. They're all the same kind of plant too. What's this? Must be something you maybe a squirrel brought in or a mouse brought in. They like it? They like it? What's this little guy? Light around in there a little bit better. Just see what we can see. Nothing else in here. This plate is just sitting here. I think it's held down with, with tape. I think this is tape. So we will leave it there. Just as the last person left it there. The radio is designed to have a metal plate underneath it. Okay, I'm going to leave the pile of debris there for now. I'll have the cleaning staff look after that later today. And now let's see what we got here. What have we got? Pretty boring from the front. So this plastic here is very often all twisted and knurled up and you can see some of that has happened here because it, it has a support on this side but there's no support on the other side because it had the light bulb swung in behind it so so you can't you can't have a support here so these things are very often all distorted this this one's not bad but it's definitely distorted too Another thing we want to check really quick. What's this? What's this stuff? So this is a steel. This isn't a string. There's some more of that uh, debris here. So it kind of kind of gives you an idea. Just well, how did that debris get underneath the radio? Well, it got underneath the radio because a mouse could fit through here. These are all the little mouse collections, are they? 
light has come loose here. It's just a, it's a little holder it's popped out of. I'll just leave it like that. So a lot of these radios are made with a kind of uh, kind of metal called pot metal, and uh, not not these parts. This is, this is there are steel cans here, and and I'm sure this is all aluminum. Um, underneath one of these two is the tuning mechanism. I can see the uh, shaft from here going into this box. We need to look inside this box. You can see the screw grips. They're not, uh, the screws are missing. The screw is missing. Some of the screws are missing on it. So we can't lift it right up. I'm going to have to tip the whole radio up and look underneath. We'll get to that in a moment. So, okay, let's spin it around here. Not an awful lot to see up here. Sure, there's a tube. Oh, did I just knock that off? I don't think so. I think the first, I think uh, all these got replaced and they were all made short. And they're all pulling the tubes over. And this one, this one pulled itself right off. I, I may have done that easily. But he made all these too short. That's been kicking himself in the rear when he put it all together. This one, too. Tubes are on place. Every tube looks the same. This is probably an RF coil back here. RF coils. Probably. It's probably a gang inside the tuning capacitor for every one of these. For every one of these. So it's probably four gangs in here. Okay. The fact that they shielded these tubes like crazy, I mean this is this is major shielding here right over the top, a little slot for the wire. It tells you these tubes are really sensitive to being interfered with. Okay. I'm going to tip it up now. I want to tip it up so the capacitor is high and this I'm assuming this is the major uh, transformer inside this box here. It's low because that's where all the weight is. This is pretty close to being a flat surface, but it has this piece here. So when I tip it up, you know, I'm thinking about when I tip it up, how can I uh, make sure it's stable? That will help. Screw on top, we look inside, but we want to look inside this one. Why wouldn't we look in here too? Okay, let's look in here. I mean, the objective here right now is to get a look at everything. So some kind of rational assessment and plan can be made. On how to approach this. Okay, let me get my brand new screw container system. Where did I lost it? That's great. I got, a, I got a nice new way of saving screws from a radio like this. And uh, I can't find it. Okay. We're going to go with the plastic bag. Video makers cut all this kind of stuff out of their videos, and I tend to leave a lot of it in. It's just, you know, doing this kind of nonsense here. That's uh, because I'm hoping you, when you view my videos, actually find these interesting and relaxing and uh, distracting. But relaxing is the important thing here. Uh, and I think that the, you know, the, the hyperspeed videos we all watch were. People even cut cut fractions of a second between words. 
that stuff out. It's too much, I think. Wow. Well, that's good. Glad we looked in here. Talking about a big transformer. There's one. Wow. Look at that thing. And then look at that. We got a fuse. A fuse that can be put in two different positions. And that relatively new looking capacitor there. Uh, this is probably the work that was done um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, whenever it was. That's certainly not original. Somebody spent a lot of time making this happen. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look at these this mounting screw here. to see but my guess is this is all that somebody drilled a hole and put the screw through to mount this capacitor nicely done I could be wrong but I don't think that's original they just I think this is quite modern compared to the rest of the radio but that's good that's very good that's uh, that's a very good thing now let's go back around here Flip it up now and look underneath. Okay, where'd that board, where'd that piece of wood go? I'm gonna have to have this flange. Either it's gonna go up on the flange and a bigger block. I think that's actually a better, a better move. That's perfect. That's perfect. I can't even see what I'm doing here. Look what I'm doing. Playing with pieces of wood. Okay, we're going to flip it up. I don't know if I can hold it out this far. Um, we'll flip it up, step one, get it on its end. It's pretty tall. It's a pretty tall radio. And it's on its end. Okay. Don't go anywhere now. Get there like that. Good. That's pretty stable. Let's make it even stabler. Put this out here a little bit. Yeah, it's not going. Not going over. Here we go. What lies under this radio? Whew. That's a lot of stuff to look at there. Wow, this is a real this this radio has really been worked on a lot. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. For sure, this is this is added in. This is added in. This has got to be a replacement. Uh, this could be a replacement here. It's just hanging here. Oh my gosh, this this looks different. Some heavy soldering done here. Not quite what you'd expect from the factory. These yellow wires are new. Oh, this, this could be this could be original. This this old guy here. Um, this is probably a this is a coil here. Oh, the wires are loose on the outside of it. There's another. Uh, capacitor located here. This could be original, but I don't know. I have a. Uh, there's another one down here. But look, can you see the wires cut? So if somebody's, I think, has abandoned these, or at least this one, and replaced it with an alternate capacitor, it could be this. This one, the lead comes out and is soldered right to the can. That's weird. Um, that might suggest that this has been disabled. Why would somebody bother doing that? They just cut the wire like they did down, down on this one. 
It's a mystery. This looks like a complicated coil right through here. The problem with coils is, uh, you know, if you shove too much current down them, the wires burned, then you're in big trouble. There's another, some, some oddball stuff here. Very old capacitor. It's disconnected. And a, uh, a toggle switch. Look at how this switch works. I can just move these wires a little bit. Also, look, black black tape. Okay, so this is not from 1929. This is this is this is definitely from about 10 years ago. <coughs> Somebody got in here, did a lot of work. They 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 have you know replacing this. This a lot of work was done. Here's another uh, canned capacitor, but this appears to be a replacement. It doesn't have the old look to it. Big blobs of solder here, but nothing soldered to it. So what happened to the things that were soldered there? And I was going to show the on-off switch. Okay. A better angle on this. So this is the on-off switch, this piece sitting here. Can you see there's a rotating lever? It's a little hard to see in there. There it is, with the, the point on it, and I bring it around, click. So how does a point grab a knob? See the round knob on top of the, you can't see it, but the knob has a big slot in it, and this rotating point is coming around and then finding its way right into the slot, click, and then when you go to turn it on again, click and then it's released to continue its travel because it's also the volume control the extremely stiff volume control so that's interesting interesting how they uh, how they came up with all this stuff now if we look at original wiring versus new wiring you start with a power cord so this looks this part looks original here and because of the way the power cord is done, it's 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 wiggly loose. He, he's put a knot here to stop it from being pulled through, but nothing to stop it from being pushed in. So you got wire movement, but it's spread over a long distance. So probably not hurting. Looks like looks like this connection is getting worked a little bit. That seems okay. solder spills here. Looks like this solder that got spilled here probably came from up here, but who knows. Let me give it the close-up camera treatment here. I'm going to run through it with the, the close-up camera. As soon as I uh, find out how to, how to work my, uh, my computer. Start in the bottom corner. The camera's set a little too close. I'm gonna have to make an adjustment here. Okay, so we're gonna start in the lower right corner here and just look things over. So this is obviously factory done here. If you think about it, you know, in 1929, radios had been built commercially for about five years. That's about all. So, you know, how, how well the manufacturing processes had been worked out, you gotta kind of wonder. Like, for instance, they were working under poor lighting in crummy factories using soldering irons that were heated up with blowtorches. Uh, there you go. This is not the modern day stuff. How they managed to build these things at all is kind of impressive. So here's here's a wire wound resistor here. 
to the center tap. Think of this as two resistors, two wire wound resistors. Well, that's kind of odd. It's made to be screwed down, but it's not screwed down. So is, is this a replacement part? Hard to say. Hard to say. Okay, it comes up to a resistor. Is that a replacement part? Oh, look at the soldering job there. So it looks like a new part soldered to the old lead. So this is this is a replaced resistor. Well, you can see it right there too. He's done a lap joint. Lots of parts replaced in here. So somebody knew what they were doing. They probably knew better than me. There's another wire wound resistor tucked in back there. Also center tapped. So sometimes these are related to the uh, heaters and how to use the heater as a cathode. And they center tap essentially the cathode connection, essentially center tapped on the heater. And uh, you know, I could be wrong about everything I'm saying, so um, you're just hearing what I believe to be the case. You're not necessarily hearing the truth. Oh, this stuff kind of dripped down this way. Why would it drip this way? I mean, I could see why now, because I got the radio on its side. But this should kind of drip off, shouldn't it? Why would it drip run down there? So there's this capacitor. This guy is still connected, I think. Would appear to be the case. Swing this other light over here. It's got black tape on it. And these it's a pretty clumsy way to connect it here, but done. Hey, see that? Do you think that's what was done here? There were two two more sticking up in this area, and they're gone now? Are they, these, yeah. So I can make up a big story here without really knowing. So this is a new wire here. Really looks like this was put in too. Got resistors up in here. This is the uh, phono input area here. That's a capacitor. scratched here. So, well, this is really weird. Somebody took the time to scratch that, put solder there, but there's nothing soldered to it now. So it's just possible this radio has had a number of lives. It's been brought back a couple of times. It just seems strange. Unless somebody tried to scrape off the solder, like to, to, to level it, I don't know why would they do that. Oh, but here's this new transformer. So, I mean, the good news is the parts that are most likely to cause a, a, a terminal problem with this radio look like they've been replaced. The problem, though, is the radio is now, like, see, these wires are cut here into this. Uh, the, the radio may not, and this one's cut, cut here, too, cut on both sides. Cut there. Yep, yep, there's a cut wire. Oh, wait a minute, that? Yeah, that's a cut wire on the side, just like the yellow one, but this wire comes out and they ground it. For some reason, they wanted to ground that. Yeah, so as I was saying, if uh, someone knowledgeable has been working in here, they could have done alternate circuitries and things like that. Uh, they could have employed prick, pricks, yeah. <laughs> tricks, they would have employed tricks. This is the speaker terminal here. 
they would have employed tricks and they didn't write down what those tricks are hmm so this could be very very challenging as has happened in the past when someone has messed around you know I did a uh, radio a short while ago it was on plexiglass this vintage actually a bit older than this and it was pretty clear about halfway through that in fact the radio wasn't at all what it appeared to be uh, somebody had essentially redesigned it on the fly if you like it's a one-off a Franken radio and I'm willing to bet most of these radios from 1929 that are here today and especially if they work are uh, are Franken radios to some degree so you know that that implies and what I had to do last time I had to draw my own uh, schematic diagram that's that's nearly impossible to do when you've got wires in bundles like this and the colors have disappeared yeah very challenging now this isn't really the problem with this radio though the problem is the speaker so I'm going to get the speaker out and we're going to take a look at that. Okay, so that looks like a Red Roberts screw in there. What are we taking off exactly here? Hmm. Well, it looks like, in fact, it's not done the usual way. Those Robert screws are for holding the the board. It's it's this screw and this screw loose. Oh, look at that! Not screwed in. So somebody dropped two uh, wood screws to where bolts need to go. This is meant to be bolted here. So that's it. That should. I thought this was going to be a bigger deal. I spent more time getting the camera down here than. Yeah, there it comes. Oh! Oh! <laughs> eh, it doesn't get any worse. Oh, the smoke. Oh, man. What has happened to this speaker? It's a mess. Oh, boy. Okay, another quarter? Any more quarters? No money? No money. So a lot of dust right here, next to no dust here. Somebody's been cleaning this very regularly, I think. And there's the name of the cabinet maker there. McLagan, McLagan, Stratford, Canada. Built by, no date. Lovely. Okay, well, let's see what we got with the speaker now. Okay, so it's got four uh, leads coming to it. We're doing two different jobs. One is bringing up the sound signal. It's going to feed it into a, a voice coil. It's kind of located kind of up in here. This is the moving diaphragm here. Uh, nowadays we call this the spider. I guess that's a better term for it. Okay, so that itself will make a little bit of sound. Just that, without this big cone hooked up. Well, that could be what the owner heard during his demonstration. And I heard nothing during my demonstration. Here's the... Uh, oh, okay. There's something funny going on here. Can you see that? It's a big speaker. Um, so down here, this is the voice coil terminal connection. So the wire coming from a transformer here comes up, hooks up to the voice coil. This wire, this wire here, the one that's going up, is usually fixed in place at one end very carefully because the other end 
and maybe not so much in this design, but in other designs, the other end is tugging right on the uh, right on the cone. Now everything needs to be fixed. So there's the terminal back here, and, but here's the wire out here. Why did why is that? Why did somebody remove it from the terminal here and do this to it? Well, I don't hear an answer. Who is that person? You should be held to account. We, we can kind of look up from here. Let's see what we can see. Okay, so there's the uh, output transformer. So this is fed with the uh, uh, high voltage. Uh, a high voltage goes through this to reach, reach I'm assuming these are the output tubes here high voltage up here and then the output from the transformer is then connected to the the two leads we were looking at to go to the voice coil and then there's two more wires coming up on the main cable they're in here these and they're going back to what must be a pretty hefty coil inside here and if we look really carefully actually see voice coil copper in here. Now is that coming up? You can see it just down in here, just to the right, you can see some copper color there. And that's the copper voice coil. Look at how large the diameter is on it. Much larger than a modern speaker. So the purpose of the big coil back in here is to provide the magnetism for the voice coil to push against. Now, what about fixing something like this up? Hey. Well, push all this back and, well, I mean, when I push it back, it's cracking. It's just cracking here. Look at this. There's nothing left of this. Not this nice surround that survived. Isn't that something? This has survived all these years. On a lot of so giving out a little bit here. On a lot of speakers, this is the part that wears out. And especially in some modern speakers are made with foam in here, and the foam has no life. You know, maybe ten years if you're lucky. Okay. So in terms of making sound out of here. Pretty sure this diaphragm will make a little bit of sound. In terms of testing this, it's, it's very difficult to test something like this. You, you have to put the proper coil through, proper current through the coil here. Um, you can certainly check it for continuity and stuff like that, but I think we already know that in the uh, test I did originally. So the speakers also often have foam around here to make an airtight seal. When I push this up against the speaker board, they want this to be airtight. Now the whole idea of uh, speakers and cabinets and baffles is to keep the air that's in front of the speaker from getting around behind it. So if you picture this at high frequencies, this doesn't matter, but in the low bass, song, bass sounds, with this traveling in and out, Okay, it's pushing air forward. At the same time, it's pulling on the back. It's making high pressure here, low pressure there, and the air is going to slip around the end here. At high frequencies, the air can't make it. It's things moving too fast. It can't get around, so it doesn't it doesn't affect the high frequencies very much. But if you don't baffle, if you don't make it difficult for the air to make it back there then you're going to lose a lot of bass. It's literally short-circuited. It, it, there's no wave of pressure leaving the speaker, or a very, very small wave of pressure. So the first thing you can do is you put a board here, and you just make a, an infinite board. Just like a huge wall, like you mount this in a, in a huge wall. So the air here has to travel, you know, half a mile that way to get around the end and a half a mile back. Well, obviously, you don't have to go half a mile. You have to go a distance appropriate for the uh, the lowest note and all that kind of stuff. 
but that's pretty impractical. Um, you can't have speakers hanging in your house with a huge, you know, six foot board on the front of them. And it would even have to be bigger than that probably. So what do you do? Well, how can you block the air behind the speaker from touching the air in front of the speaker and leaking? Well, go ahead and baffle it. But then instead of having the baffle go infinite and infinitely out, just, just bring it around as a box and contain the inside air in the box. And the inside air can't touch up what's out here. Presto, you solved it. Well, almost. Because now you got a problem with pressure buildup in the box. So you need a big speaker box if you want to let that cone move a lot. You go small speaker box and pressure problems will keep the cone from moving as much as you want it to. So the way you solve it with a small speaker box is you put a big hole in the front. But if you put a big hole in the front, some sound is going to come out of that hole. But if you engineer the hole properly, so you have the right size hole, and you put a, put a, uh, a tube behind it, you engineer that right, right diameter, right length, right size box, everything, you can get that uh, hole to actually help with the sound of the speaker and kind of boost the bass. Bass reflex speakers use that principle. So it all, it all starts it all starts with you can't let the air leak around the edge of the speaker. That's, how, that's the whole problem. Otherwise our speakers would just be hanging out like this. We'd never put them in a box and all that kind of stuff. There you go. Speaker theory 101. So, next question is, what am I going to do with this? In the short term, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'll leave it as is. It's going to make some sound. We'll get the radio working. Get, get, this will make some sound. Then we can decide what to do about how much sound is coming out of this. My guess is, not a lot. The, the cone's here for a reason. Shovel the air out. Um, can't operate the radio without the speaker plugged in. The, the, trans the coil here is an important component of the power supply of the radio. If you don't have the speaker plugged in, the radio is not going to work for sure. And all these tubes. Oh, we got one more thing to look at. One more important thing to look at here before we finish off. I was heading for it and I got the sidetracked. We got to get this can off. We got to get that can off. Okay, so the can we want to get off is, is up here. There's a screw there with no nut. Okay, there's a screw here with a nut and it's got this grounding, it's got a grounding terminal on it. There's a screw with a nut there. Screw with a nut there. So just one missing, one nut missing. But I did see something interesting here. When I, uh, let me just put the camera up this way. What's this thing? some kind of adjustment. And what's that number? 823. And there's some more writing on it there. Somebody's names on it or something. Let's see if we can see that. Uh, it's upside down. Maybe when I'm done, I'm supposed to put my name on there too. Let's spin this around. Let's see if we can read it right side up. Oh, I'm banging my microphone here. Just a second. The microphone's a little close. <laughs> what I'm doing? Hang on. Oh, talking about the microphone. I don't have that microphone on. Whoops. There we go. That should sound a little better. Now let's read what's up here. focus properly on that so we're going to go use the other camera it's actually a better one to use maybe it's instructions on where the gold bars have been hidden anybody watching curse of oak island chaplain oh this is an address 86 chaplain Crescent, 86 Chaplin Crescent. So Chaplin Crescent is in uh, Toronto. And that, that's actually the... 
Who? H-U? Hi. Oh, that's the phone number. That's the phone number. My, my number when I was a kid was Logan57653. And this guy's number must be H-U. H-U would be what? I don't know what that would be. Hungry? Some word anyway with H-U on it. H-U-0-9-2-7-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-
crumbling apart and would ruin a radio like this but not in the case of this one so if they have a radio with pop metal in it you've probably got a radio if it's working now it won't be working forever whereas this one has a chance this one has a chance to work forever it's got a string here and a string here or a wire actually it's a, it's a cable it's a steel cable it just goes up and right over the top here and down oh yeah oh no it doesn't there's one separate wire going this way and the other wire coming this way a light bulb in there So now I'm saying to myself, so what are you going to do with this thing? We're going to start by assuming it can work and that it didn't work over yonder simply because. Look, there's a clamp, a clamp here. Why, why, why didn't he use it? There's a clamp here for the uh, power cable. Why, why didn't he clamp it? Maybe he did and it's come off. Maybe he clamped it and it's come out. Doesn't feel like it. Yeah, I, I think really this is a really a kind of a get it playing if I can, and then from there pay attention to the uh, you know what. So this this capacitor up here, this one here, which still has connections, has another capacitor stuck on the back of it here. That's what this tape is doing. So this one is soldered here to give it mechanical you know, stability. And then another one has been taped to the back of it here. And I see this ground is coming around to here. Um, you know, they grounded this terminal. So that's what he's done. So he's grounded out the original terminals on the original capacitor. He stuck another one back here and wired in with these yellow wires. This is what he's done. Yeah. We got to assume too, whoever did all this work knew what they were doing and made this radio work. Uh, they wouldn't have just done all this work and then walked away from it. Yeah, I think that's the name of the game here. The name of the game is get it working and then decide what to do with it from there. Uh, it may not be much. I'm guessing the owner isn't looking for me to completely restore this and I'm not looking to do that. That's not my style. I'm a repair guy. I get it working. Um, yeah, good. That's it. I'm done. Wow, that was a long, that was a long look. But, uh, you have to do that. I'm sure there's still more in there I didn't see that I'll see as I work along on it. Great, thanks a lot for watching this video. And uh, we'll concentrate on making it work tomorrow.